Hello and welcome to Taylor Talks Comics. Today we're going to go over the groundbreaking, earth-shattering Spider-Man run um, in omnibus format by Todd McFarland and David Michelinie. Stay tuned. Okay, we're back. So this is the Todd McFarlane and David Michelinie Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus. This is the run where Todd McFarlane put his name on the map. Prior to this, he did the Incredible Hulk run with uh, Peter David, but this is the run that really shot him into the superstar um, of comic book artist range where he would live to today. I mean, he's still the biggest, one of the biggest names as far as comic book artists go. So here's his spine. You get the Amazing Spider-Man title lettering, David Michelinie, Tom McFarlane, a great McFarlane image of Spider-Man in the top band. This is, I think, one of the DM covers. This is like a recolored version of a McFarlane cover, I guess. So I don't, I don't love this cover so much, but that's okay. And then I'm back in the great Marvel Manor. You get all the uh, cover images of all the um, covers included in here. For the first time, more than 800 pages of pivotal Spidey material. So this includes Amazing Spider-Man 296 through 329 and material from Spectacular Spider-Man Annual Number 10. Oh, another card in there. And then underneath the dust jacket, you get this image so you can see which that one looks recolored as well. That's, that's not the original coloring. The uh, flaps just have words, no more images there. So it's the front image. The spine is exactly the same. And then the back, oh no, actually it's not. The, co the image down there is Venom over Spider-Man. That's different. And the back image is what you saw on the cover. Got some black end papers here. And then image there for the omnibus. You can see there is some bleed through. This is the most the newest printing, I believe. And the pages are really thin. You can see bleed through on the next page where it says Amazing Spider-Man in there. So that really kind of sucks whenever you get pages that are mostly white. You can see a lot of bleed through. Here's the credits of all the people that worked on this. And then the um, table contents, sorry, with all the issues and when they came out and they're titles as well and then gets right into it so this is the david michelinie and Tom mcfarland omnibus so it starts off with Dave, where david michelinie's run on his amazing spider-man started and alex saviuk is on the uh, pencils for this first issue and then i think mcfarland takes over nope it's still alex saviuk i think it takes him a few issues okay here it is so 296 and 297 are Alex Saviak, and then Todd McFarlane takes over. And this is the earliest Todd McFarlane Spider-Man work. And you can see it's much, very much more subdued. It's not like the signature Todd McFarlane style that we would go on to see in later years. Um, but it's kind of great walk, reading this omnibus in that context because you're kind of seeing him evolve. And kind of seeing him slowly push the boundaries of what he's quote unquote allowed to do because he's doing this in the Marvel way, um, how to draw comics the Marvel way, if you will. And he almost has like almost like an early Neil Adams ish style to his panel layouts and whatnot. This is the first appearance or cam what do you call that? A cameo or whatever. It's Venom. <laughs> um, and this cover, which just looks very similar to 298. There's not a lot of dynamism or variety between those two covers, but I digress. Almost like a Neil Adams artwork, which I would say is interesting because I, I would say the same thing about um, Frank Miller and 
uh, Pils and Kevich both kind of started off with more of a Neil Adams type artwork, which those two were very much mentored by Neil Adams. I don't know that McFarlane, I don't know if he ever had interactions with Neil Adams. I'm sure he did, but not that I know of. If, if he did, let me know in the comments. But again, so he's slowly pushing the boundaries. Um, you do get a lot of romance in here between Peter Parker and Mary Jane. Oh, this is a great issue. So the anniversary issue 300, which you've seen this cover done a million times. I think there was some controversy too with the reprint of this. This was supposed to have this cover, but they didn't do it. And then they Marvel put out dust jackets you could pick up or something. I don't know. Um, I didn't bother with that. But this issue in itself is a great all time, like single issue of comic books. I should credit to Rick Parker on lettering. His lettering is phenomenal throughout this entire book. Um, just even like the title lettering, but also these, like the lettering and the bubbles and stuff too. Great, great letter. I think he really brought the team together as a third, a third party, if you will. Um, but this issue in itself has a lot to do with Mary Jane being afraid because Venom encountered her with her and kind of broke into their house and she's uh, freaking out over it. Um, and Peter's trying to let her forget about that, trying to get that off her mind, um, because there is some, a little bit of, like, PTSD involved with Mary Jane in that. Um, so it's just this constant fear, and it almost reads kind of like a horror movie, like a horror comic, which I think would inform, you know, see, you're starting to get a lot of the, this is when you start to really get to the McFarlane, like, this is such a McFarlane trope, having, like, the big head, um, on one side of the the page and then over which we'll see that a, a number of times but this is like the issue where i really feel like mcfarland was like goes gangbusters and really stretches his muscles because this is the issue before and it's like oh, okay like that's but then it's like like i don't know what it was in him i'd love to ask what changed from 299 to 300 where he's just like i'm going for it forget everybody else i'm going to do my own thing and make this a Todd mcfarland comic instead of a marvel comic uh, uh, thing there by McFarlane. Would have loved to see him on uh, a an issue of Fantastic Four. Silver Sable takes place a lot in here. So one thing I would like to note too is if you're a fan of like the '90s cartoon of Spider-Man, the animated series, they obviously like the creators of that show obviously took this run to heart when they wrote those. Um, episodes and, and the way that they're, they're drawn and whatnot because there's so many stories within this omnibus that i feel were like ripped from this run of comics and put right into that that series um there's just so many little influences so many characters that i feel like play a big role in this uh era that would go on to play a big part in that that series so if you're a fan of like the 90s spider-man series and you haven't read this i would highly recommend this because it feels like a more adult version of that cartoon again just some real mcfarlane image imagery here with the the hatching on the faces and just the figure drawing there's him really going for it. you're starting to see him stretch into the mcfarlane that we would know and love um trying to, i don't want to miss any points i had here but these this is such a mcfarlane panel right here too where you're focusing on the eyes in a really smaller panel with like the etched uh, border there um, where's, okay, here's a great, uh, image of <laughs> Peter and Mary Jane shopping. This, I think this is when McFarlane starts inking himself, probably, right? Yeah, he's just the artist on this one. Which, that's a good point to bring up, too, because when McFarlane starts inking himself is when it, it really gets to that point. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like... The mid 300s are probably when he starts inking himself. Uh, which is 307. Because it just looks darker. You can you can just tell what McFarland like, inking himself. Here's another issue where he inks himself. I'm trying to find the, the Prowler though, because that was a kind of a revelation too for me when I was rereading this. And this run is important to me too. I, I guess I should have brought this up. This is one of the runs that, like, really, um, if I were to write. Uh, a list of comics that made me who I am as a, as a comic book reader. This would be make that list for sure because my brother, um, who has his own YouTube channel called Real American Brian, 
please go subscribe to the channel. He has a lot of focus on G.I. Joe comics, which Todd McFarlane did draw some issues of, and I think he even has some some videos about Todd McFarlane, his work with uh, G.I. Joe comics. But, um, yeah, Real America Brian, go subscribe to his YouTube channel. But he's my older brother, and as a kid, he bought me the trade paperback that included a lot of this material. And I read it, like, front to back, like, so many different times as a teenager because I, I didn't have, not even a teenager, a preteen, I think. I, was, I think I was 9, 10, 11 when he bought that for me. Um, I read it, like, front to back so many times because I didn't have... A bunch of money to go buy other comics so it was one of the few comic books i had access to i guess and i loved it so much um that this was kind of a nostalgic trip for me to go back and um this is a great mcfarlane-esque image to go back and read so i really wanted to know if it would hold up this would it just be total nostalgia or would it actually hold up as a great comic and i have to say that it really does hold up as a great run, a fun run of comics. Um, I would recommend this for anybody wanting to read Spider-Man comics. Um, for sure. <laughs> this is an Inferno crossover, but says the non-mutant superhero. <laughs> um, but he draws a great um, Green Goblin. And I think that's one of the things, too, is that eventually, throughout the later parts of this run, McFarlane, Michelini, here's a, okay. So Michelini really talks to McFarlane about, like, what do you want to draw? And McFarlane really liked the Steve Ditko stuff. So a lot of the Ditko villains is what he would go on to draw in this run and then going forward into his adjectiveless Spider-Man run. A lot of the capes in here, though, as you get to these later issues, are so Spawn-like. You can tell that this was, like, truly informing what McFarlane would do for Spawn later. Like, you can imagine um, just putting Spawn's face on this image if it's in black and white, and it would look... It would not look out of place for the Hobgoblin there. Here's another Dicko villain with the lizard. So he really just wanted to do like the Dicko stuff. And I'm pretty sure I have an action figure that's exactly this style of the lizard. I had one as a kid, um, which is probably another thing that endeared me about this run. Here's another McFarlane uh, silhouette or profile um, face that takes over half the image there. And then there's, I mentioned it earlier, but there's a few issues with the Prowler where he's like, it looks so much like Spawn or like what would become Spawn. Video. Okay, so what I wanted to show you is Prowler with his cape and everything. It looks a lot like what he would eventually draw as Spawn. And it's, it's a little bit more subdued. The cape, the cape is still ridiculously long and unrealistic, but it's still very much Spawn-like. And I, that was a revelation for me when I was rereading this as an adult. It was like, he's drawing Spawn before he even had the idea or the concept of who Spawn would look like. Like, look at this long cape. Like, <laughs> if you're tr if you're going to measure that cape, it's going to be like 100 feet long and so unrealistic. But I don't care about that kind of stuff. Like, I, I would much prefer... Oh, hey, here's a uh, homage to Action Comics 1. I'd much prefer, the, like, the more cartooning look of exaggerated figure, exaggerated capes, exaggerated other things to make it look more action-packed and dynamic. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to show. And then there's an issue back here where he uh, would revisit the Hulk. I think it's one of the latter issues. There it is. So, like I said earlier, Mark McFarlane had a huge run on the Hulk with uh, Peter David, and though I love the way he drew the Hulk, like this giant monster um, figure, and it was, a, it was a monster comic when he was doing it. And I think McFarlane's always had some horror vibes in his comics. Like his Spider-Man one was more of like a horror comic-esque, and then Spawn is too, and then Hulk was like just a giant monster comic. So it was great to see him come back to the, to the character of Hulk um, in the Spider-Man run. And then Hulk in space... And then, oh, then the small run on uh, Spectacular Spider-Man, just a few issues, or a few pages of it. It's got McFarlane art, and again, the Prowler cape around the border there. Just, I mean, is that not Spawn? Let me know in the comments if I'm crazy. That's got to be Spawn. And then, 
Uh, here's the back matter. So you get some covers that McFarlane did. So you get a What the page with uh, Raven the Hunter and Spider Ham. Um, this is a few pages of Bat Boy, or Bat Man, I guess. Sorry, the Park Knight. David Michelinie's, um Afterward, I guess. Here's a Spider-Man poster by McFarlane, an Amazing Heroes preview. These are the Marvel Tales. So these were um, old issues that collected, I think, Ditko stories. But he did the covers for them. They always had newer covers with these reprints. No, I guess they weren't just Ditko stories, because that's the death of Captain Stacy. But they were reprints that he just did the covers for. That's a cool X-Men by uh, McFarlane. There's Juggernaut, who uh, McFarlane would go on to have that big crossover with uh, Rob Liefeld, his X-Force. Some hockey kids. Oh, this is a uh, Amazing Spider-Man Skating on Thin Ice, the cover that um, McFarlane did for that one issue. And it, McFarlane's obviously a huge hockey fan. Or not obviously, I shouldn't say that. But he's Canadian, and he is a big hockey fan. Spider-Man vs. Venom. These are other covers and images that McFarlane used that were used in other things. And those are the two... I think there's three covers for this, though. That's it. That's the Spider-Man Omnibus by Todd McFarlane. And then if you want to keep reading more Todd McFarlane Spider-Man stuff, you'll have to get this Omnibus, which is which I'll do an overview of on a separate video. And this is a thinner one. And this includes issues... Because he, he's... Um, after this run, McFarlane would go on to do the, do the adjective with Spider-Man run, and he would do issues 1 through 14 and 16 with X-Force number 4. Um, he didn't do issue 15. That was done by Eric Larson. So if you want all of McFarlane's Spider-Man work, you have to get both of these omnibuses, and you'll have it all. And you get uh, Peter David's Hulk Volume 1, and you have 95%, 99% of what McFarlane did for Marvel. Thanks for watching. Uh, give the video a thumbs up. Um, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. And share this video with all your friends. I'd really appreciate that as well. Thank you for watching.